Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So today's lecture is continuation of my last lecture. And in this last lecture, I started with acquired pigmentary disorders. So in that lecture, I almost completed uh, most of the hyperpigmented disorders. But a few were left. And so we will start today with the hypermelanosis of drug origin. Drug-induced hyperpigmentation. It can be localized or generalized and can be caused by a wide range of medications and chemicals. There are several mechanisms which are involved in causing this hypermelanosis due to drugs. And the mechanisms include increased melanin synthesis, increased lipofuxin synthesis, then deposition of drug-related material into the skin, and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Examples include estrogen stimulates melanin production. Phenothiazines, particularly chlorpromazine, form chlorpromazine melanin complexes, which are not metabolized in the body. Then post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation follow drug-induced lichenoid reaction. As a result of lichenoid reaction, there is basal cell degeneration and pigmentary incontinence. The other drugs induce pigmentation more directly. For example, zidovudine, which is used in HIV, causes pigmentation of nail, skin, and oral mucosa. So now a few drugs that are typically associated with hyperpigmentation. First is amadurone. Amadurone is done is uh, given for uh, arrhythmias and it causes photosensitivity and phototoxic reaction in more than 50% of patients. Fewer than 5% of the patients experience a slate gray or purple discoloration on sun-exposed skin, particularly face, with prominent involvement of nose and ears. Then anti-malarial drugs. They are quite notorious in causing hyperpigmentation. Chloroquine, has an affinity for dermal melanin and pigmentation appear to result from complexes of melanin, hemocidrin, and the drug. Then other antimorelias like unine and cunidine also produce generalized pigmentation. This bluish gray pigmentation is mainly on sun exposed skin, particularly the face, neck, and interior side of leg and forearm. Nail beds may be affected diffusely or transfer band uh, form on the nails and hard palate may develop a bluish gray tinge. Then clofazamine, given for, given in leprosy, uh, in prolonged treatment result in violaceous brown color and develop most, uh, most probably on the lesional skin. Many cytotoxic drugs will result in hyperpigmentation. The skin discoloration may develop from one week to several months after initiation of the cytotoxic therapy. And this hyperpigmentation can be localized or diffuse and may also affect the mucous membrane, hairs, and nail. So you can see this bleomycin-induced hyperpigmentation. This is characterized by streaky appearance like we see in um, photodermatitis or flagellated dermatosis. Then this is a diffuse hyperpigmentation seen by other anti-cancer therapies. Hydentoine. Uh, given for um, um, epilepsy, has direct effect action on melanocytes, inducing dispersion of melanin in the cutis. So melan melanocytes are damaged and melanin enters into the dermis. And uh, phenytoin and barbiturate may induce Edisonian-like pigmentation or melasma-like pigmentation. Then psychotropic drugs like uh, trifluparazine and imipramine the mechanism is uncertain and probably is drug melanin complexes. Tetracyclines. There is hyperproduction of melanin in inflammatory or sun-exposed zones by direct effect of drug on melanocytes. So all tetracycline does not cause this, but the particular drug which causes this pigmentation is minocycline. And it affects various anatomical locations that include skin, nail, oral cavity, sclera, conjunctiva, skeleton cartilage, as well as viscera and body fluids. 
and the risk of pigmentation with minocycline is higher with longer duration of treatment and high cumulative dose, although cutaneous and oral pigmentation can occur regardless of the dose and duration of therapy. But generally, since we give minocycline for a prolonged period of time in acne, so the acne patients are also having inflammation, so there are good chances of having post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on the acne sites. There are four unique patterns of cutaneous minocycline-induced discoloration, and all of them share the same morphology and are well characterized by well-circumscribed blue-gray macules. So type 1, it is pigmentation is located in acne scars. Type 2, look, the pigmentation occurs in previous inflammation. And type 3 is diffuse, symmetric, brown-gray discoloration with tendency to photoaggravation. And type 4 is pigmentation on the vermilion border of the lower lip. So this is typical minocycline-induced pigmentation, which is a slate blue type. The incidence and prevalence of drug-induced hyperpigmentation, it is 10 to 20% of cases of acquired hypermelanosis. A disease course and prognosis. The discoloration is mostly reversible after discontinuation of the causative drug. In a small number of patients, the hyperpigmentation persists even long after the drug is withdrawn. And as far as the treatment is concerned, the first line is, of course, discontinuation of the causative drug and, sec uh, and secondly, sun avoidance or sun protection. And the therapy, mostly it is the laser, Q-switch in minocycline-induced hyperpigmentation. Then the fixed drug eruption. Fixed drug eruption is one of the most common form of drug-induced exanthem, and as an acute eruption settles, it leaves residual hyperpigmentation, especially in dark skin types. Pathophysiology. Immunohistochemical findings suggest that the characteristic same site recurrence of fixed drug eruption is induced by prolonged intercellular addition molecule 1, ICAM expression, in the lesional keratinocytes. And it is suggested that this fixed drug eruption is type 4 hypersensitivity to the offending drugs. Offending drugs. Pathology. The slate brown color in fixed drug eruption is due to pigmentary incontinence with melanophages in upper dermis. So there is, it starts initially with basal cell vacuolar degeneration, uh, but it is not a lichenoid reaction. Just a basal cell interface change basal cell vacuolar degeneration resulting in pigmentary incontinence. The drugs which are mostly implicated in fixed drug eruption include tetracyclines, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, sulfonamides, quinolones, metronidazoles, and some sedatives. So once a patient with FDE comes to you, you must mention on a separate piece of paper which drugs to avoid for the future recurrences of this disease. Clinical features. There is a well-circumscribed area of slate blue brown pigmentation, which usually follows the erythematous and bullous stages of fixed drug eruption. So I first go and want to show you these stages. So this is the first stage of uh, fixed drug eruption in which you can see a hyperpigmented zone surrounded by a rim of uh, erythema. There can be single or multiple areas. Then soon after, in the rim of uh, hyperpigmentation, blister appears. And uh, once this blister heals, then it leaves a patch of hyperpigmentation. In addition to skin, mucous membranes are involved. Genitalia and perianal areas are affected. And eruption can occur anywhere on the skin surface. The characteristic course is of recurrence of the lesion at the same site with development of new areas of involvement with repeated exposure to the same causative agent. Clinical variants, really a fixed eruption may be triggered by food or ultraviolet light. So this ends in a little aberration. 
then pigmentation can result from acute photodynamic and phototoxic reactions. Drugs or other chemicals with photodynamic and phototoxic activity have a potential to induce skin hyperpigmentation. So there are two types of uh, such reactions. The first is the phytophotodermatitis. It's an inflammatory and pigmentary reaction of the skin to light potentiated by furocumerins in the plants. So this is a plant-induced phototoxic reaction and the plants are those which contain chemicals furochromin, uh, furocumerin. Then the second is the burlock dermatitis. Burlock dermatitis is a skin pigmentation due to phototoxic reaction to perfumes. The perfumes that contain uh, bergam, uh, bergamot oil and this bergamot oil, when applied on the skin, it results in a phototoxic reaction leading to hyperpigmentation. The hot, humid conditions favor absorption, hence both reactions are relatively common in the summer months. Clinical features. The hypermelanosis may sometimes be heavy and persistent following the photodynamic and phototoxic reactions. In phytophotodermatitis, initially there is an intensely pruritic papulovesicular lesions that is eczematous type lesions with crisscrossing linear streaks. The common clinical patterns include a bizarre network of pigmented streaks on leg or arms. That is medodermatitis. Then, excusing limes outside when preparing cold drinks can cause blistering of the hands if carried out on a sunny day. So the fluid, so the liquid from the limes may also induce the phototoxic reaction. Handling celery either at the harvest or when it is sold can also co cause phytophotodermatitis of fingertips if taken if taken place under direct sunlight. So these are the typically streaky appearance of papillovesicles and hyperpigmentation later on in case of phytophotodermatitis. Burlock dermatitis. The burlock dermatitis is deep brown pigmentation that follows the pattern found by trickle of droplets of perfume over the skin from their point of application. This pigmentation fades after weeks or months and the condition is now much less frequent because of decrease in tendency of use of this bergamot oil in perfumes. So this is how the burlock dermatitis would look like. It giving an appearance of uh, trickling of um, liquid on the skin. The treatment ladder. Prevention is the first and foremost avoidance of photodynamic or phototoxic drug plants and perfumes. Then use of oral antihistamine during the acute phase of papular vesicular rash. Then sometimes parenterally administered epinephrine, uh, epinephrine in case of anaphylactic reactions. Post-inflammatory hypermelanosis. Post-inflammatory hypermelanosis is a residual macular pigmentation resulting from prior skin inflammation. It can develop at any age, but more common in deeply pigmented skin. It's a disorder where there is disruption of basal layer of epidermis, such as seen in lichen planus or lupus erythematosus, and frequently develop areas of slate brown hypermelanosis. Similarly, in FDE, fixed drug eruption, hyperpigmentation occurred due to damage in the basal layer. So most of the post-inflammatory hypermelanosis follows lacanoid or interface dermatitis. Hypomelanosis of epidermis may also result as, a, as a, is an end result of cutaneous inflammation due to reduced epidermal melanin. It is explained by an increased mitotic rate of keratinocytes, resulting in diminished transfer of melanosomes to the melanocytes, to the melanosomes from the melanocyte to the keratinocytes, resulting in hypomelanosis. So clinical features of post-inflammatory hypermelanosis. The pattern and distribution of pigmentation is somewhat allow a retrospective diagnosis, 
such as lichen planus, herpes zoster, dermatitis herpetiformis, or papular urticaria. The circumscribed pigmentation at the base of scapula is characteristic of notalgia parasthetica, which is a sensory neuropathy of dorsal spinal nerves, which present as intense localized pruritus or parasthesias. And the pigmentation there is the result of chronic rubbing and scratching. Then we can we see the reticulate pigmentation corresponding to the underlying vascular network seen in erythema epigny when the skin is exposed to direct heat of some heater or heating device. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation occurs following trauma to the skin by different cosmetic procedures like derm abrasions, ablative or hair removal lasers, particularly in dark skin individuals. So whenever you are planning an ablative, um, ablative aesthetic procedure on a pigmented paper uh, skin, be careful about this potential post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Infective causes of dispigmentation include late secondary syphilis, and late pinta. You can see uh, the residual psoriasis and the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation due to psoriasis. The differential diagnosis. The acquired diffuse hyperpigmentation. The skin lightens slowly over the time spontaneously with therapy. This usually takes 6 to 12 months but may take longer. The treatment letter, the first line is prevention of the inflammation, regardless of etiology, treating, treating the underlying cause in case of lichen planus or lichenite drug reaction as quickly as you treat the patient, less chances of developing the post-inflammatory pigmentation. And lastly, the sun protection. Second line include various topical treatments like hydroquinones, retinoid, azelic acid, alpha-hydroxy acids. Third line therapy are the lasers which include q switch lasers, alexandride lasers, or the pico lasers. But the results are limited. Complete clearance of pigmentation is rare, and recurrence occur in 6 to 12 months. So, um, among the, all the um, uh, causes of uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, the most important are to, is to avoid this side effect in case of aesthetic procedures. Ashy dermatosis and erythema dyschromicans persistence. Ashy dermatosis is a spectrum of cutaneous pigmentary disorder of uncertain etiology that is characterized by development of persistent gray blue hypermelanotic cutaneous macules for which no specific cause is identified. Erythema chronicum persistence is limited to those cases where there is an inflammatory phase with erythema associated with this pigmentation. Those cases in which erythema is present share many features with lichen planus, especially lichen planus pigmentosus, including the lichenoid inflammation in histo histopathology with basement membrane zone damage. Ashidermatosis is seen most frequently in young adults and that too in females. And most published cases are from Central and South America or East Asia. Clinical features. Clinically, ashidermatosis is characterized by numerous macules of varying shades of gray. They may initially be, there may initially be sign of inflammation with a red slightly raised palpable infiltrated margin. The trunk is affected in two-thirds and face, neck, and upper limb in over one-third of patients. Condition is persistent and it slowly extends. Lesions are mostly asymptomatic, although some patients experience mild pruritus, generally asymptomatic. Mucous membranes are not involved. So you can see the slate brown hyperpigmentation on the face, on the neck, and other areas. And uh, this ashy dermatosis is very similar to lichen planus pigmentosis, but generally 
if the skin of the face is involved, we label it as lichen planus pigmentosus. And if the body is involved, we label it as ashy dermatosus. So histologically, there is an interface change, basal cell vacuolar degeneration, and then pigmentary incontinence. So the pigmentation is because of this heavy pigmentary incontinence. So differential diagnosis is lichen planus pigmentosus, post-inflammatory hypermelanosis, secondary to some identifiable cause, late pinta, treatment ladder. First line is cosmetic camouflage cream and makeup. Clofazamine, 100 milligram per day for three months in inflammatory cases. Second line include Dapsone, oral corticosteroid therapy and ultraviolet therapy. The generalized treatment of hypermelanosis. The treatment depends essentially on establishing the cause and if possible, reversing the condition that have given rise to hypermelanosis. Simple. Since in many cases, exposure to sunlight intensifies the pigmentation, photo protection is must. Then cosmetic camouflage is advised in female and those who are very hypersen who are hypersensitive. A number of compounds are used as skin bleaching agents. The, the most um, old and well-established is hydroquinone, and it is given mainly in concentration of 4%. Sometimes the Kligman formula that contains a combination of hydroquinone with retinoid and corticosteroid is preferred. Other depigmenting agents like azalic acid, like alpha-hydroxy acids, the MAP, SAP, uh, kojic acid, are also added in different creams may be prescribed. Chemical peels with glycolic acid or salicylic acid are used, used, useful adjuvant to the topical treatment. And finally, lasers and light-based devices are used to treat hypermelanosis, melasma, and other pigmentary conditions. Now we have come to acquired hypermelanosis. So all those conditions in which there is decrease in skin color pigmentation and that is acquired and not congenital. So the most important disease which we are going to cover in acquired hypermelanosis is, of course, vitiligo. Vitiligo is the common form of localized depigmentation. It's an acquired condition resulting from Progressive loss of melanocytes. It is characterized by milky white, sharply demarcated macules. And vitiligo is generally classified into two major forms, the segmental and non-segmental vitiligo. The non-segmental vitiligo includes several variants like acrofacial, mucosal, generalized, universal, mixed, and segmental vitiligo can be uni, bi, or plurisegmental and is classed separately. Vitiligo affects 0.1 to 1% of world population. It can begin at any age, but majority is in 20 to 30 years. The earlier the onset of vitiligo, there are more chances of becoming generalized. Prevalence is equal in both sexes and affect all races but becomes more obvious in darkly pigmented races. Vitiligo is an autoimmune disease and it is associated with other autoimmune conditions like thyroid disease, hellonevus, uveitis, and with central nervous system involvement and premature graying of hairs which occur in Vogert koyanagi harada syndrome. Pathology. If we are in doubt, we go for a skin biopsy. And in skin biopsy, we do a DOPA reaction. And DOPA-positive melanocytes in basal layer of epidermis are lacking. In inflammatory stage of vitiligo, there will be um, heavy infiltrate of lymphohistocytes in the dermis, just adjacent to the basal layer. So there are many theories uh, as far as the etiology of vitiligo is concerned. The main uh, effect is the loss of melanocytes and this is uh, due to different pathogenic mechanisms working together, which is called as convergence or integrated theory. The first and foremost 
theory is the autoimmune or autoinflammatory reaction a combination of deregulated innate or adaptive immune response is also proposed there is an important role of heat shock protein 70 and ll37 which is released after cell injury both helper and cytotoxic t cells from the margins generate type 1 cytokines this theory is supported by the fact that various effective treatment options in vitiligo have an immunosuppressive effect on the activation and maturation of T cells. For example, local steroids and topical immunomodulators like calcineurin inhibitors. So these drugs affect the cytotoxic and helper T lymphocytes, especially uh, T1 cytokines. Self-destructive theory of learner suggests that melanocytes destroy themselves due to defect in the natural protective mechanism that removes the toxic melanin precursors. This is another theory. In vivo, repeated frictional trauma to perilegional skin in non-segmental vitiligo has been shown to induce detachment and death of melanocytes, which is called as the melanocytoregi. A neurogenic mechanism has been suggested, whereby it is hypothesized that compound is relieved at the peripheral nerve endings in the skin, which can have a toxic effect of melanocyte. And this compound is neuropeptide Y. Genetics. Almost 30% of patients of vitiligo have a positive family history. Genome-wide association studies have identified several susceptible loci for generalized vitiligo, each responsible for a small part of the genetic risk. Environmental factors. Kobner phenomena, also called as isomorphic phenomena, is defined as the development of lesions at site of trauma <coughs> to uninvolved skin of patient with cutaneous disease. It is suggested that Kobner phenomena function as a clinical parameter to assess and predict the clinical course of vitiligo. So if a patient is developing vitiligo as a result of Kobner phenomena, it shows that the disease is still active in that patient. Clinical features. The amelanotic macules in vitiligo are found particularly in areas of repeated friction, chronic pressure, or trauma, for example, hip, dorsa of hand, finger, feet, elbow, knee, and ankles. The lesions are prone to sunburn because the lesions lack pigmentation, and distribution of lesion is usually symmetrical, although in segmental subtypes, it is unilateral and band-shaped. Rarely, there is a complete vitiligo, which is called as vitiligo universalis, although most often a few pigmented areas remain. This condition is generally reached in those uh, children in which vitiligo occurs at a very early age. Pigment loss may be partial or complete, or both may occur in same areas, trichrome vitiligo. In trichrome vitiligo, you can see various shades of uh, hyper and hypopigmentation. Macules usually have a convex outlines and increase irregularly in size. This is how the, the, the vitiligo lesions are typically described as the depigmented lesions rather than hypopigmented lesions because there is a complete loss of pigmentation in these lesions. Hairs in the patches can remain normally pigmented but can also be depigmented after a certain period of time. And sometimes the depigmentation of hairs becomes diagnostic of vitiligo. The main symptom is the cosmetic disability although some patients present with sunburn and amelanotic areas. Vitiligo also start in children and more likely to show, who are more likely to show segmental vitiligo. Mixed vitiligo, the coexistence of non-segmental and segmental vitiligo in one patient is called as mixed vitiligo. Hypochromic vitiligo or vitiligo minor. The term minor refers to partial defect in pigmentation so as I have told you, 
uh, lesions of vitiligo are described as depigmented. But if lesions are not depigmented and hypomelanotic, it is called as the hypochromic vitiligo. Uh, usually, in most patients, the lesions start as hypochromic vitiligo and later on, the lesions turn completely depigmented. Differential diagnosis. There are a long list of differential diagnoses which include halonevi, nevus depigmentosus, nevus anemicus, then inherited or genetically induced hypomelanosis, which include the piebaldism, Wardenberg syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, pigmentary mosaicism. These are described in some other part of the text, and I've given already lectures on this. Progressive macular hypomelanosis and secondary hypomelanosis. The secondary hypomelanosis include the post-inflammatory hypomelanosis, for example, P. alba and lichen sclerosis or morphia and post-traumatic hypomelanosis. So a few images of the differential diagnosis. This is uh, a hypopigmented or depigmented lesion, but it is different because in from the normal vitiligo that it is present since birth and the lesions have a geometric outline and not convex outline and a solitary lesion which is unchanged over many years. So this is nevus depigmentosus. Then this is nevus anemicus, which is basically a vascular pathology. Uh, and you can see an erythema with areas of hyperpigmentation. If you, if you stroke the skin by your finger or by a tongue depressor, um, there will be an erythema surrounding these areas of hyperpigmentation. But these hyperpigmentation will persist like this and will not develop erythema. Then a very common um, diagnostic error occur in case of petriasis versicola. There will be slight scaling. And if you go on a Woods lamp examination, vitiligo will be milky white. However, there will be a yellow green fluorescence, um, or sorry, orange yellow fluorescence in cases of petriasis versicola. Then in old patients, uh, these depigmenting rather than uh, these hypopigmented rather than depigmented lesions on trunk and limbs it may be because of hyperpigmented mycosis fungoides. Classification of severity. The affected body surface areas is usually is often used to score the severity of the disease. Disease course and prognosis. Vitiligo have an unpredictable course. It is gradually progressive, sometimes expanding rapidly over a period of several months and then remaining quiescent for years. Spontaneous repigmentation can sometimes be noted in sun exposed areas and can have a typical perifollicular appearance. Sometimes it happens that a person develops vitiligo and in a period of few years, whole body is involved. And many individuals develop one or two patches of vitiligo, which are persistent and unchanged over years and are called as the stable vitiligo. The segmental vitiligo generally start earlier in life then non-segmental vitiligo and often stabilizes within first year of onset. Investigation. Usually the diagnosis is straightforward, but if you are in doubt, then we can go for a skin biopsy. Uh, and in skin biopsy, there is uh, a complete loss of melanocytes at the dermoepidermal junction. In clinical diagnosis of vitiligo, Wood's lamp is essential and it is really a very helpful tool in diagnosing vitiligo. Management. The response to treatment of vitiligo is unsatisfactory. Most, um, especially the lesions which are present at the acral sites, particularly surrounding the nails. So these are the sites which are most difficult to treat. The first line treatment of vitiligo is, of course, topical corticosteroids. That is 0.1% betamethasone valerate or 0.05% clobetasol propionate, which is quite effective in early stages of vitiligo. Then, and most recently, the topical calcineurin inhibitors like uh, pimercolimus and tacrolimus are used successfully. Ties twice the daily application, but both the treatments will take months for complete healing. The second line treatment is, uh, of course, the um, phototherapy, which include PUVA or UVB. And uh, these therapies 
selectively target the um, the uh, the melanocytes. Um, there is a laser which is called excimer laser, which operates at the wavelength of three zero eight nanometer, which is the UVB wavelength. It is also quite effective. This therapy is uh, started with minimum erythema dose and is gradually built up and is given for a prolonged period of time, uh, two to three times a week, and uh, it will take three to six months for complete repigmentation. Third line treatment is uh, include the surgical methods like grafting techniques, especially for stable vitiligo and segmental vitiligo. Different surgical techniques for repigmenting vitiligo, including the tissue grafts, full thickness, punch graft, split thickness graft, suction blisters, or the cellular graft. Cellular grafts are the melanocyte culture and grafting, and cultured epithelial sheet grafts. Lately, the use of hair follicle outer root sheet is introduced. The three tissue graft. Full thickness, split thickness, and suction blister seems to have comparable success rates in inducing repigmentation. Deep pigmentation treatment. In those patients with extensive vitiligo and a few residual areas of pigmentation left, the patients want that these pigmentary areas should be treated so that they become completely depigmented. So, in such cases, we use uh, different lasers like Pico lasers, cryotherapy, or cream, which is 20% monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone. Lately, a new treatment modality has come up for the treatment of vitiligo, and that includes tofacitinib. And there are, uh, uh, as, as far as the studies concerned with the use of tofacitinib in vitiligo, you can refer to my previous lecture, which I have already given and is present in my uh, channel. Then halonevus. It is designated as the development of halo of hypomelanosis around a central cutaneous tumor. The tumor is usually a benign melanocytic nevus, but may be, but may it can be a neuroid nevus, a blue nevus, a neurofibroma, or a primary or secondary malignant melanoma. Halonevus is a phenomena occur in 1% on white population and usually seen in young people of either sex. Halonevi occur with increased frequency in patients with vitiligo. So a patient of vitiligo has more chances of developing a halonevus. An immunological and clinical association of halonevus with cutaneous malignant melanoma are, is described. And it is also associated with Turner syndrome. Pathology. Most halo nevi are compound nevi, and there is frequently a lymphocytic infiltration of the nevus, and constituent cells may show damage. So, in histology, you see a dense lymphocytic infiltrate surrounding the nevi, and as a result of this infiltrate, the melanocytes are gradually lost and damaged. There is no known triggering factors, although association with sun exposure and sunburn is implicated. Clinical features. Vitiligo is present in personal or family history. Circular areas of hypomelanosis occur around the pigmented nevi, particularly on the trunk. Multiple lesions are common and halos are about 0.5 to 2 cm wide surrounding the nevus. Disease course and prognosis. The nevus tend to flatten and may disappear completely. The T pigmented areas often persist but may pigment after many years. Investigations. Excision of nevus may be indicated in case of doubt about its benign character. Management. Normally, none is required. It should be remembered that halo around a benign nevus is relatively common, whereas malignant melanoma is rare and melanoma surrounded by halo is extremely rare. Mutilating surgery must never be undertaken without preliminary histological examination by an experienced pathologist. Acquired syndromic hypomelanosis. So uh, under this heading, we are going to discuss a few conditions. 
The first is Bogart Koyanagi Harada syndrome. Various combinations of synonyms have been used for this disorder and is now generally referred with all the three names and abbreviated as VKHS. Etiology of Bogart Koyanagi Harada syndrome is yet to be established. An abnormal response to virus and immunological mechanism is postulated. Electron microscopy of depigmented skin show absence of melanocytes as we see in vitiligo. It mainly affects dark skin. It is rare and is widely distributed. Most cases occur in third to fourth decade, but children may be affected. And the three common sites which are involved in the syndromes are eye, skin, inner ears and meninges. Criteria for diagnosis. The first and foremost is bilateral ocular involvement with early signs of diffuse choroiditis and late signs is ocular depigmentation. Then the neurological auditory findings include meningism, tinnitus, and cerebrospinal fluid pleocytosis. Then the skin sign include alopecia, vitiligo, and poliosis, which is white band of hairs. Then another criteria is there should be no history of ocular trauma or surgery preceding the onset of uveitis. And number five, no clinical or laboratory evidence that is suggestive of some ocular disease. The typically the condition is first diagnosed by ophthalmologist as uveitis starts with the march of signs and symptoms later on. Alzandrini El El syndrome. Alzandrini syndrome is characterized by unilateral facial vitiligo associated with unilateral retinal detachment, white hairs, poliosis, and deafness. So the unilateral is important here. There are similarities with Bogart Koyanagi Harada syndrome in which skin, eye, and auditory changes are observed and etiology is unknown. Post-inflammatory hypomelanosis. Hypomelanotic areas occur following resolution of eczema, psoriasis, PLC, and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. The superficial eczema known as p alba, which is commonly seen in children, present as white, somewhat scaly, ill-defined areas of hypopigmentation on cheek in racially pigmented children. Hypomelanotic macules are also seen in petriasis versicolor and hypomelanosis due to loss of functional melanocytes is seen in lupus erythematosus and lichen planus, in sarcoidosis, in lichen striatus, in leprosy and secondary syphilis. Investigation. If you perform a skin biopsy, uh, it is helpful to investigate the possible cause, particularly the MF. In suspected P. versicular, Woods light examination help in confirming the diagnosis. And on histology, there will be um, uh, candidial uh, P. alba and uh, there will be Petrasosporum species seen in the stratum corneum with spaghetti and meatball appearance, highlighted by PS stain. Disease course and prognosis. The post inflammatory hypomelanosis is generally reversible if melanin production and transfer of keratinocytes can be restored. Progressive macular hypomelanosis. A common acquired dermatosis characterized by ill defined numular macules, mainly affecting the trunk. Common skin disorder that is often misdiagnosed, seen mostly in adolescent and young adults, and it's postulated that different subtypes of propionibacterium species might be responsible for progressive macular hypomelanosis. So it's an ill-defined condition in which, in which there are hypomelanosis uh, mainly on the trunk, not depigmentation. It is an entity that affects the trunk with ill-defined numular hyperpigmented non-scaly macules. 
Condition typically affect in areas which are rich in sebaceous glands and lesions converge in and around the midline. Rarely proximal extremities had a neck may be involved. Progressive macular hypomelanosis may be a stable condition with slowly progressive over time. A spontaneous regression is rare but is possible. Wood's light examination reveals the orange-red fluorescence, not the yellow fluorescence as we see in case of P. versicolor. Management. A recent study with intra-person comparison of two treatment studies. The first with 5% benzyl peroxide and 1% clindamycin lotion, the typical anti-acne preparation in combination with UVA versus low uh, potency, moderate potency corticosteroid 0.05% fluoroticasone in combination with UVA shows that antibacterial treatment with UVA are superior than the steroid. Both PUVA and UVB are reported to achieve improvement at least transit, uh, transiently in few cases. This condition may regress spontaneously within a few years. Then chemical depigmentation. Like chemical hyperpigmentation, this depigmentation is mainly because of the effect of chemicals when applied to the skin. And the chemicals most likely implicated are those derived from phenols and is an occupational leukoderma in work workers which are in contact with these chemicals. And these chemicals include para-tertiary butyl phenols and phenolic germicidal preparations also produce the same effect. Occupational leukoderma occur in workers in contact with monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone or monomethyl ether of hydroquinone. Then 4-tertiary butyl <clears throat> uh, catechol is also a cause of occupational leukoderma following contact sensitization. Areas most commonly affected are drossa of hands and the depigmented areas frequently enlarge and new ones appear even after the patient is no longer in contact with these chemicals. And the areas may or may not repigment. Treatment with sorolin is usually ineffective. So PUVA therapy is ineffective in chemical depigmentation. Experimental studies indicate that these substituted phenols have a selective lethal effects on functional melanocytes. <clears throat> Idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. It's an acquired leukoderma with discrete round to oval porcelain white macules, approximately 2 to 5 millimeter in diameter with increase in number with age. Commonly seen in more than 80% of patients with those above 70 years. Female are more seen as compared to male, mainly because they are more, uh, more sensitive of their uh, appearance. Most likely seen with light color skin, idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis is hypothesized to be UV-induced, although controversy exists. Some suggest that it is a normal aging or photo-aging process. Pathology. Idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis is characterized by slight hyperkeratosis with epidermal atrophy and flattening of fatty ridges. Histochemical studies show a decrease in melanocytes and melanin content but not complete loss. Clinical features. The lesions are porcelain white, 2 to 6 millimeter, and sometimes larger. Borders are sharply defined, usually convex borders. Skin marking of the lesions is, are normal, so they are not atrophic. Susceptible locations are pretibial and the forearm. Other chronic sun-exposed sites like face, neck, and shoulders may also be involved. So you can see these gutted hypomelanotic lesions. And patients usually come to us with the concern of vitiligo and they have to be explained that these are normal aging spots and nothing can be done about them, mainly. The disease, the number increase with age and no spontaneous repigmentation occur. Treatment is neither required nor is effective. However, few therapies are suggested which include systemic and topical retinoids, topical steroids, cryotherapy, topical tacrolimus, and superficial derm abrasion like CO2 laser, but I would never recommend such an ablative treatment for uh, such a benign condition. 
among all the therapies, I would recommend topical tacrolimus to be tried in this case. Punctate leukoderma. The punctate leukoderma was first described in patient who developed multiple punctiform hyperpigmented uh, achromic spots after several months of poor treatment. Later, similar cases were described after UVB therapy for psoriasis and after topical and systemic PUVA for segmental vitiligo. So, punctate leukoderma is mainly a condition following a UVB or UVA therapy. And seen in young adults, ultrastructurally, punctate leukoderma demonstrates slight to severe damage to keratinocytes and melanocytes. And it suggested that the phototoxic damage to keratinocytes and melanocytes by sun exposure or UV therapy is the etiological factor. This is how the punctate leukoderma looks like. So it is characterized clinically by multiple round or oval, small sharply demarcated punctate macules measuring 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters, so their size is half as compared to size of idiopathic guttate hypermelanosis, and found symmetrically on front of shins and extensor aspects of arms, less often on abdomen and interscapular areas, and they are not related to hair follicles. The differential diagnosis comes idiopathic guttate hypermelanosis, but punctate leukoderma is distinct from it on its clinical and histological features, the macules are smaller and repigmentation may occur. Disease course and prognosis. Persistent, although spontaneous, repigmentation is observed. This comes to the end of this talk. And I thank you all for a very, very patient listening. See you next time with another edition of uh, the lecture from the same chapter. Thank you and have a good day.